phasers to stun. Season seven, nice. I played a little bit of it. I haven't played it much this week. I actually did a whole bunch last night because I needed tons of Romulan marks. But you liking season seven so far? What do you think? The initial days were rather hectic. Yeah, there. I agree. It was debatable whether it was good or not. But um, the the recent patches have been really good. The new creator can open straight away and having tons of delirium and it almost felt like a season marks. four. Almost felt it, like a season great. four, but. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. Almost. That's why I said almost. But with some of the bugs that came out originally, yeah, I could see it. But I think the new Romulus zone is awesome. And if you haven't had a chance yeah. to get your Romulan reputation up, do it. Because there is some cool story stuff that's going on there that... Could you imagine? Because now the... We'll get into this in news later, but the Foundry's been linked up with new Romulus now. So could you imagine missions spinning off on new Romulus storyline stuff? That would be awesome to see. So go make that, Foundry authors. Yeah, but I've been doing that. Um, I'm going to plug this game because you should pick it up for your holiday season. It's called Star Trek Fleet Captains. It's just like this huge, awesome board game. And, oh my god, anything you don't like about Stowe, which is usually exploration and Cleon factions not being equal, it's equal in this game, and it has awesome exploration. You, like, move your ships through this unexplored area space, flipping over tiles, random stuff happens, like, you might encounter a black hole, or Q comes and visits your ship, or Ferengi attack you, or something like that. They're bad for you. They're the Frankie scavengers who want to steal your stuff from your ship, so it makes sense. But you you go through the board building your star bases and stuff. It's an awesome game. Check it out. They also have a new expansion where the Romulan faction got added. It only took them a year. So come on, Cryptic. Step up to the plate. I called them out. I, I had to. But yeah, so we've got tons of Foundry news this week. Can you believe how much news we have to cover? Because... Tons of it. It's, it's a nice change. It's actually a nice change. As much I think as this is our long. Like, that yeah. shouldn't be happening, but it is a very nice change of what little news of scraps of news we have to peg on every week. But we've got like right here, like almost a whole page of, of notes and stuff on the news. And we we didn't. He was like, "How long's our notes?" I go, "Open them up and check out," because we've got tons of stuff. We also got tips on touchstoning in your missions, which is basically how are you going to bring in past Star Trek canon into your missions? Like, say you wanted to. Do one on the Guardian forever and go back to that. That's touchstoning. So we'll have tips on doing stuff like that. And then we're reviewing A Good Ship Goes to War, a Doctor Who Star Trek crossover foundry mission. You'll hear our opinions on that. And then finally, we'll end with community feedback where we ask you a question pertaining to the new way the foundry spotlight works. So why don't we just move on into news? To the news, and our first bit of news is the Foundry over the course of the Season 7 patch. Now, as you know, since the Foundry's been released, with a bit of debatable Season 4, it's been taken down for about a week or two every time it's every time the Season's been released. Yep. Season 7 was no different. And here, basically the Foundry was off for a couple of weeks, and I think as of this, as of recording, the, the, the Create Content tab is still disabled. I'm not sure whether it is by the time this episode releases, but hopefully it's only a couple of days away. Yep. But uh, either way, you can't review missions, but the missions are there to play. So anybody out there with the mission, I suggest you go and try your mission and see if it's any bug. And if it is, yep. report to the dev team. Yeah, I know like one of mine was, we tested yeah, it out. Perfect. Yeah, I know we tested uh, Deep Space 11 out recently, and it was bugged. And I know mm -hmm. I've heard other authors That's saying right, yeah. there's been bugs too. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But... uh 
right now you're not getting affected because people can't downplay your mission right now because reviews no. are off, which is nice because yeah. that's been an issue in the past. I'm glad because last season yeah. they took off reviews and this one they have too, so I'm glad they've, they've done that. But okay, we talked a lot about the console quickie exploit last mission. Did it actually fall we we with this patch or did it just mutate? Well, it it did, but then it didn't. It sort mm -hmm. of it, it sort of mostly crushed, but it, it's it's to put a metaphor in it. It's sort of like this um one little slip escaped. So it's like floor, hanging on to the edge of the cliff. Like yeah, I don't want to die. It, it escaped the crushing and decided to mutate. So it did both really. It it, it both fell and mutated into a new one. And what this thing is, is if somebody else in the instance completes the Foundry Daily, like three missions or something, everybody else in the instance has their Foundry Daily wrapper completed as well. Yep. So if both of us have the, the, the Foundry Daily demo, if I go and complete a few quickies or whatever kind of, type of missions to do it, yours will complete at the same time. You don't have to do anything. Yeah, so one of our members in our fleet, Darkseid, was one of the first ones I know who picked this up. Where he was just walking around uh, the Cleon Academy thing, and his Foundry Daily completing, he's like, "Whoa, I wasn't doing any Foundry missions. It was at zero like a minute ago." And during yeah. the course of time, other people complete missions to to bump his up. So that was a, an issue we were saying. We picked it up when we ran out of this week's mission, where we would complete it, and boom, we'd get like double credit and stuff. So. I don't know if it's really a console quickie exploit, but it is a major bug that I, th I think this works out better than the console quickie exploit, honestly. Mm. I mean, it's not hitting one console, but you're completing more. No, maybe not. I like it more, though, because it's not hitting one console, but it's going to get fixed it's eventually. It's going to be fixed eventually. Because so. this, is, this isn't as much an exploit as it is just a bug in the system. I mean, people are going to exploit it, but it, it is a bug, and it's going to get fixed probably a lot quicker uh, than the console quickies were. But, bug that includes it, but anyway... We have a new reward system to the Foundry. Will it bring more people to the Foundry, and is it an improvement? So, basically, the new reward system is, yeah, we have where... Now you've got missions marked as whether the reward will complete, or they will not. But it is the same reward that you've been getting. So, I've heard some complaints on that, where people are like, Oh, the console clickies are dead, what's the point? It takes too long. Yeah, I think those people aren't going to be hopping into the foundry to play these missions unless they're going to be doing quicker ones or stuff and, like that. And speaking of rewards from foundry missions, I've, I've played a couple of uh, non-combat missions. I've actually got diplomacy XP. That's, out of yeah. That's a new feature as well, so if you find a, a non-combat mission, you can actually level up your diplomacy XP using foundry missions. I like that. That's a great way to encourage foundry mission uh, playability. Especially non-combat missions, because we don't see as many non-combat missions at all in the game, and come on, it's Star Trek. And I have to say, I love a non-combat mission when it's done right. It can be a blast. But, is it an improvement? Or is it a, a, is it setting back the foundry reward system? What do you think? Mm -hmm. I think that the dismissal of the quickies is good for foundry missions and adding that diplomacy XP to those aren't quickies, but don't provide any combat is also mm -hmm. a good thing. So the reward system is kind of a half and a half either way, but diplomacy XP definitely encourages the, the foundry stuff. I I see it as a little bit of improvement, but I don't think it's what I would have liked from the, the foundry reward system, because I still feel like you're not getting as many rewards for missions anymore. Mm. Especially with, we'll get into this later when we cover the new Foundry Spotlight stuff, because those rewards, blah. But I still feel they're kind of lower than your average mission. And I guess you kind of have to have that with a, a Spotlight thing, but I wish, I think it still could use some work on improving it to kind of, to get it close to other missions in the game so that people are still drawn to play Foundry for rewards and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, so we talked about, the Foundry was broken over Thanksgiving weekend. So I know before I left to go uh, to my grandparents' house for Thanksgiving, I had checked the forums, and they were bringing it back up Foundry missions. So they'd be up all weekend. It was like right before Thanksgiving break would have started at Cryptic, probably. Mm -hmm. So they brought them up, and I think within the first hour, people started reporting issues with their mission, where I think the bug was they'd, they'd go into their map, and if you walked to an area and the NPC spawned, and you walked away, and then later on you'd come back, the NPCs wouldn't reappear. So you know how yeah. if you walk around and you get far enough out of range, they'll go off the map or whatever. They're just you actually zone. encountered this twice, Murphy. During yep. um, once actually during our review from today, and actually in your own mission as well, the NPCs yep. just weren't there. And then when we finally reviewed, went to 
go to review our mission, it was there for all of a sudden. So it's it's an on and off bug. It can happen in some missions, then yeah. it doesn't. And so it's something that, it's instant based, probably. And I think the major problem was over Thanksgiving weekend, a lot of people play the game because they have time off. And yeah. I heard a lot of Foundry authors going, this isn't good for the Foundry at all. It's going to make people think, oh, this is still a broken thing. And I kind of agree. I think some people might have picked up the Foundry for the first time over the weekend. And if they counter bugs like this, it's going to give them a negative opinion on it. So was it good yeah. that the Foundry was up over the weekend? Or I don't know. Um, I think that bug definitely should have been squashed. I, I th I think it I think it is because the bug wouldn't have been squashed at all if the foundry wasn't up. If it, the, if they just re-enabled everything at once, people would have encountered that issue anyway, probably, and then they'd get bad reviews. So if anything, this is probably actually a good thing. That's that been the caught now. Aren't enabled yet. So, okay, it can turn people away. But if the bugs are fixed, then generally, the people playing it in the future won't get bad opinions about it. So, I think it it's the lesser of two evils, effectively. Yeah, I, I, I wish the bug would have got tested, though, some other time than Thanksgiving weekend, because if I wasn't traveling then, I would have totally been playing still a whole bunch more, including Foundry missions, and encountering that would kind of turn me away. But it's going to have to get squashed eventually. It was just happened to be this week that we that they brought it back up when they, when they couldn't fix it. But anyway, um, speaking of other Foundry things, we had a triple patch and then later a holodeck patch, which added quite a few interesting and rather how should I put it um, well thought after features Foundry stuff foundry. Yeah. yeah great things they added all the time ships to the foundry yes not, actually, not as actual to NPCs by the way just before you say that um, but just the ships it's like the wells and just stuff the, just the ships and the costumes yeah, can like I wells, Morbius, Kren, that's all yeah can I just throw something out here because I, I I was running through one of the Romulan patrol missions and this is kind of off topic but I just want to say I was running through like one with Tholians in it and randomly throughout the mission, a well ship appeared and started shooting at the Tholians. And I was like, whoa, what are they doing? What? So it's got me thinking that there's some type of time travel thing going on where maybe the... Do you, the remember, do you remember back at the beginning of September when the wells were leaked? Uh, we yeah. Saw it every time in the final mission, mm -hmm. sometimes like the Doomsday device or anything. Mm -hmm. So it's not too surprising that it's actually there. Yeah, that's true. So there could be some really cool story stuff going on for like the Wells ship and stuff. And if if the Wells ship is appearing in these patrols often, like especially against the Tholians, you could come up with some awesome plot line when Tholians are added to the Foundry about the temporal Cold War going on and stuff. And that would be cool. Um, we got NPCs should no longer despawn when a player's that's, not nearby. But we're still seeing that. About, it's, it's still seeing it. We're so seeing it still. It's not entirely fixed. Cryptic, you're lying here. Fix it. Uh, using a duplicate map should no longer create imperfect duplicates. I guess it wasn't a, a good enough copy or whatever. I didn't notice that, but I haven't been making missions for a while. But mm. apparently that was being an issue. The big one, big I, we talked about it. Go ahead, tell us. We, we I think this is the biggest one yet. Our recent new map, Big Zone, New Romulus, has been added to the Foundry for hookup as a Christmas. Yes, that, that gave me so many ideas for the Foundry. Like I was like, oh, I have all these ideas already sitting, taking up the rest of the slots if I got back into into the foundry but now i've got these new romulus ideas because the new people have complained that new romulus doesn't have like a story behind it as much but it's got a lot of background story and what's going on here mm -hmm. and a foundry author could totally use that to set something up i mean complete tier two of romulan reputation and figure out what's going on with the tal shiar there i don't want to give any spoilers but you can kind of see the tal shiar are, are doing something especially one of the instances where you go to but you get to get this background story to the to the stuff that you could totally flesh out in the foundry and I'd love to see that so we've got all this stuff in the social zone as well which is huge so you can go up and talk to Romulans there and you can probably use a doorway to go into like the uh, the ruins and stuff where the Tholians are hanging out and that would be really cool to see I think this is the biggest thing that's dropped here on the foundry that's going to give foundry authors tons of stuff to do with their missions and now here we go. Now, another, another big, big one. one. Yeah. A really big one. It's now possible to set patrol paths for your NPCs in Founder missions. Now, we had seen this cop on Tribble a couple times, but they kept pulling it down because it wasn't working. So I assume it's working now. Now, the problem is, and I kind of go, oh, man, because when, okay, so when you go to set up a patrol path in your mission, they already tell you that unless it will not work in your preview mode. So you're going to have to publish the mission play it and make sure it's working and if it's not then you're going to have to go back unpublish it work on it some more and then publish it again and mm -hmm. that's kind of a pain and honestly that's not a way to test your mission 
So I hope there's a way that they can get it that you can preview the patrols and preview mode because I think having to publish and test is going to screw some stuff up. I mean, it's not easier and it's going to give headaches. Mm. And I'd also like, uh, I know I was listening to podcast UGC and they were talking about the patrol paths and stuff like that. You don't know what the speed's going to be for when they're running around because it's probably just going to be no. zero through a hundred or hundreds like warp speed, Mr. Sulu. And zero's like, let's just baby crawl or not move at all and stuff like that. It'd be nice if a, a foundry author out there can get out what each number is so like 20 is walk 40 is a, a jog and 60s run and stuff like that if we could get numbers out there like that that would really help with people not having to go publish your mission make sure the speed's correct for all the patrols and then unpublish it that would be nice to see but that's all the foundry stuff we got in this trivial patch notes but there was tons of other cool stuff that was in there but overall i thought this was a nice little patch for the foundry not the major thing we've been looking for but it was still a nice patch i mean we got it's new romulus and the patrols, which people have been asking for for a while, so a lot of people have been waiting for that. Thumbs up there. Oh, and hidden patrols, they've been in. So, not hidden patrols, uh, hidden NPCs where you can now hide them. Those are two major storytelling features that people have been asking for for a while, and we finally got it. And I know there are some people who weren't building foundry missions because these two things weren't there. So now we might be seeing some new authors because of these new features, which is always nice. Based on our poll back in episode one, I think it was. When we asked like what the fe- what the feature do you want? I think um, NPC hidings and patrols was one of the most af- keen after features. Mm-hmm. This is probably one of the biggest changes to the Foundry and additions that you could have just by adding a little teeny weeny feature. Yeah. Like, every, every object, but NPC can't. By adding the hidden NPCs, it opens up a massive doorway for Foundries to get around exploits like um, this happened in the dialogue, but you can't yeah. do it actually at the Foundry. You can do it at the Foundry now. You don't have to go for the workaround. So. Actually, in some cases, if you have found emissions that do work around this... Go back and change them. Yeah. Unless hopefully it won't, they're oh, spotlighted. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Let's go into the spotlight. Because, alright, so for those of you who haven't been listening to any other Foundry news and you only get it from here, the uh, Cryptic already came out a while ago and said, uh, shortly after uh, Episode 7, that they were changing the way the spotlight missions work. And that already previously spotlighted missions would have to re-sign their EULA and all that stuff, which is basically the major change is going to be when you ask for your mission to be spotlighted, and if it is spotlighted, you lose editing rights. Cryptic now has ownership of your mission. You do not. And this has put some Foundry authors pointing at me right Um, here eh. off. I'm not happy with it because I've talked with WeWe about this in the past. I'm, I'm one of those authors who doesn't like the idea of Cryptic taking Foundry author content and saying, this is our own content, which is basically kind of what's going on here. I mean, they could probably slap on the name of the author there. But they should be making their own missions, not using Foundry author missions. And by signing your rights away to the mission through this way, you're no longer allowed to edit. So all these cool changes that just came with Season 7, if you already had your mission spotlighted, you couldn't add those cool changes in. So like, if you had Foundry limitations in your missions where you'd say, the unit beamed out of the map, well, now you can have them beam out of the map, but you can't change it because Cryptic's not letting you. So your editing rights have been revoked to the spotlight, and this has turned some people off. Do you? What do you think, Willie, about that? Because that's one of the major changes right now. There is another one. Yeah, it, it's it's a bit of a problem. Not only for signing with the rights of the creator of actually the mission, it it, it it's your baby. It's effectively yeah. you created it. You you've done it from scrap to publish. And the problem is, the problem with this feature is the fact that there's not enough features in the foundry, in my opinion, yet to actually really put a good, dot, good, fleshed out spotlight there. I mean, you've got a co- good couple of good features here, but it's not the foundry is not really fleshed out properly yet. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think I'm it's still in beta. So many, if at all, anybody to actually spotlight him for that because they'll be just giving away the mission. And if brilliant, more fantastic foundry uh, kind of type of technology comes in season eight, then screw it. Yeah. Now, a workaround I've heard is people saying you could copy your mission and give them a copy or the original, and you could still edit the other one, but I think that's, no offense if you're actually planning to do this, but I think that's kind of dumb. I mean, having two copies of the same mission out there, people are going to flock to probably the spotlight one more anyway, because it's more plugged. There's also another problem that the mission that the author kept would be superior to the one that they gave Cryptic eventually. Yeah. So it wouldn't make a difference either way. I mean, it's just this weird thing to be doing. But, so, 
Plus, I don't think the spotlight rewards are that great. I mean, from what I've heard, I mean, you're going to get the Delithium and stuff like that, and then they're tapping on a random green, blue, or purple drop, which you kind of see with STFs right now, and what does everybody do with their STF loot bag if it's not what used to be EDC and all that stuff? Now it's the neural processors. Actually, we don't get loot bags anymore, but let's look back at the old STFs. People would, what, pass on anything that was not the EDCs or the tech drops, at least in our running groups. And what was the items that they were passing on? The random green, blue, or purple stuff. People just don't care about it. I think the re the spotlight reward should have been something a little more customized, like a green doff. I know it's not great, but at least it'd be cool to have maybe a doff or something like that. Something that's unique to playing that spotlighted mission. So people would be like, oh, there's something cool to get here that I can't get anywhere else. I'll go play it. But we're not really getting it, so... The only mission I would have had spotlighted of mine, because I don't care to edit as much, was the one I had spotlighted, Victory is Q. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like resubmitting it after hearing what the advantages are, because I've already heard people brought up, the rewards aren't that great. People who are checking out the spotlighted missions is a lot less than it used to be. Like, I know when mine was originally spotlighted, I got a huge increase of uh, players. But that was right when the Foundry Spotlight started up. It's been week after week of after week of all these spotlights, so less and less people have played it because it's not as new anymore. And possibly people have found a spotlight mission they don't like, so they don't come back. So I think that they just need to take off that editing thing, and the spotlight will still work. There needs to I've heard people say Cryptic needs to have a little more trust in authors. I don't know that many authors who are making great missions that would go into their mission and change it so it's dropping the F-bomb everywhere or stuff like that. I mean... Their mission means a lot to them, because they put hours and days into the working on their mission, and I don't think they're going to screw it up just to break the EULA when they get they get spotlighted, just to go, ha <laughs> cryptic, I'm going to screw it up. I don't see a Foundry author doing that, at least one that's going to get spotlighted. It might be a very rare thing, but I don't think cryptic needs to worry about that, and they need to show that through their spotlight system. Now, but anyway, yeah, that, it's a good new feature, but there are some setbacks we have. But uh, should we move on, Muff, to There is one more thing, though, with the spotlight. Three. There is a new f thing that I do want to hit with the spotlight, though, too. People can now submit their spotlight missions through the uh, UI. So before Cryptic Brandflakes, I believe, was just picking them out based on it, he'd email the author and say, do you want your mission spotlighted? And then they go, yeah, sure, and then he'd add it to the list on that week. Well, now players can go into the, the UI and submit their own missions. The problem I've heard with this as well is you're going to have tons of players who probably have crummy missions out there going, oh, I want mine spotlighted. It's the most... Did you see the Ferengi that I called Paul who was just saying two words? It's the best Foundry mission ever. Let's go spotlight it. So they to spotlight their mission, and that's another mission Brandflakes has to go through to see if this is good or not. So I don't know if that's as great of a system. I think it's good that they added it into the Foundry UI because now it opens up everybody's chances of getting it. But they better have people at Cryptic who are willing to look through all these missions they're going to start getting. Because if there, if you weren't, if pe if people weren't going to lose their editing rights to it, everybody would be clicking the spotlight feature. Just go, hey, what the heck? I might get spotlighted, and people might play my mission. But so I don't know if this is the best thing for the Foundry Spotlight or not. I think it might. They definitely need somebody checking these missions out. But it's all right. Yeah, DevBlog Twenty Three, which uh, I'm reading now, is. Does an overall summary of this uh, kind of spotlighting thing okay. and all of the different final features that thing. So if you don't want to really go through the patch notes and things like, what does that mean? What does this mean? Read dev blog number 23 and it, give, it gives an overall summary with it. So it, it, it's a good little thing. So basically everything that we just talked about is summed up in dev blog 23. Mm -hmm. So you just watch this for nothing. No, I'm kidding. I mean, it's more fun to hear us talk about it than read the dev blogs, especially when they talk about Cleon's story. Oh, did I go there? I went there, didn't I? Well, maybe we should talk about some uh, foundry missions now when we review a good ship. Ghost. On top of mission review, we are doing a good ship goes to war, and here are some few basic stats before we get into it. As of this recording, it has 311 players with an average star rating of 3.93, which is quite good. And it was an entry for the Foundry Challenge number two. And as the main aspect to it, it is essentially a Star Trek Doctor Who crossover mission. Which, I gotta say, 
I like Doctor Who and Star Trek, so thumbs up there. I mean, I've even written fan fiction where uh, my characters met the Doctor, so this is kind of a bonus there. And Wee Wee's British, so you know his answer when you ask him that if he likes Doctor Who or not. Actually, I've met some British people who don't like Doctor Who, and I was just like, what? It's like not liking Big Bang Theory or whatever. I don't know. I Watch Big Bang Theory if you haven't watched it. It's an awesome show. There, I plugged you guys so you can come advertise for us. Anyway, yeah, so this we'll be covering this crossover, which, is it a good crossover? Do we think it's awesome? Or what? Let's find out. So we'll look into story first, as always. Captain John Smith sends out a distress call asking for your help. With your shuttle, you delve into a time loop, and only a woman from the 21st century can help you escape the loop so that you can save the entire galaxy from the Borg. Now, just as a real quick, we have dealt with a mission with a time before. I think it was our third ever review, second or third ever review. It was um, uh, cause and effect by Rogue Enterprise. Yeah, where it was a time loop. Yeah, this is another one of those. I, it's done a little bit differently, though, and I, I, I'll get yeah, into that. Different, yeah. But uh, also, this is a shuttle mission, so we'll get into that in gameplay, because, of course, shuttle missions, there's not plenty of them, and I, I know I love shuttle missions when I get into them in Foundry stuff, because, come on. I know some people hate their shuttles, but shuttles are cool. I like them. Shut up, all you people who hate shuttles. Give them a break. Anyway, the plot is okay, but at times, I, it's it's hard to follow at points. I don't know if you got lost through the story, Wee Wee, when you were reading through it, but I know there were some points where it was like, wait, That's what's well. going on? Why uh, is this happening? Um, yeah. The, at, the, at the beginning where things start happening, you're like, okay, what... What, what, what's happening here? I have no idea what's happening. I know you got thrown Which off is, by that. It's a good plot point, but I, I was a little bit confused at the same time. Yeah, I, I didn't have that at the point you're talking about. There's a point where you kind of do a time jump, and for Rui it wasn't as obvious. Me being the time tra not the time travel geeky person, I managed to piece it together a little quick quicker, but there were other points in the story where I also kind of got thrown off. So it's, it's, it's something you might want to look into, but of course, sometimes time travel gets a bit kooky. But the, the, the plot there is, could use some work, and... It feels like it should have had more elements from Doctor Who in it, because it didn't feel as much as a Doctor Who episode, or a Star Trek episode as much. It felt kind of like this meshing that didn't quite mm -hmm. quite work out. I mean, and it, it kind of goes back to the writing, which we'll get into in a little bit. But, oh, there's... So we talk about this time loop. At the beginning of the mission, there's this idea that you're going to go through this mission out of order. So, like, you've already done this five times you don't remember, and every time there's this flash, you've jumped to another point of this event that's going on. That's not the whole situation, though, for the entire mission, and I feel like it could have been, because that's a brilliant thing that I would have seen in a Doctor Who episode, where the whole episode's done in events out of order. So, like, you do the beginning near the end or something, or in the middle and the end's near the... It's stuff like that. It's just out of order. It would have been hard to write, and I know you talked about it. And it's it like, also would have been... That's even more confusing, I'll say that. But so. I think it would have been so Doctor who -y that that would have made up for it. I don't know, it's conflicted. It, it would take a really good writer to, to pull it off, so... The characters in this mission are okay. Um, the only two characters that are introduced in this mission, and that are the main ones you talk to, is the companion Daisy for the Doctor, and Captain John Smith, which, of course, the writer can get away with is that, because... And John Smith, come on, it's a common name, that's why the Doctor uses it as his alias sometimes. But uh, Daisy, I wasn't thrilled with. I mean, she kind of felt like... I don't like Martha as a companion, so... She kind of felt like a Martha to me. I wasn't that into her. And so the, the Doctor in this mission is obviously the 11th. You look at the looks, he's wearing the bow tie, and he has the same hair and all that stuff. Uh, his portrayal, though, of the Doctor in this mission, I didn't feel was on par as with the writing from the show. Like, reading through the dialogue, it didn't feel Doctor who -y. Like, he didn't feel like the Doctor was talking. It felt kind of like another version of the Doctor should have been used here, maybe the 12th or something like that, a later online, not one that we kind of already know in the show. I'd just like to make a real point that uh, the Euler says that you can't actually use characters from other franchises, but the author gets away with it in this case by putting stuff all over the character's face. So before you say anything, yeah, that's that's how he gets around it. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, not really much touchstoning, <laughs> actually none at all, from both shows on this mission. So there's not like a Star Trek event that's pulled from or a Doctor Who event that's pulled from. I don't know if one could have been used here, but it, we're just mentioning that there wasn't any. I mean, it would have been cool to touchstone from stuff both from Doctor Who universe and Star Trek. Because come on, it's a crossover episode. Uh, there's no grammar and spelling issues, so... 
plus side there. I mean, you're not going to get like, oh man, the spelling's bad and all that stuff. So that's a that's a highlight for the mission. Mm. Overall, the story could use some work. Uh, improved dialogue, characters, and, and even plot in some cases would make this feel like a more awesome Star Trek Doctor Who crossover, which I think if you're going to cross the two together, you really need an awesome story for that. And this one, it's good. Uh, it's received a 6.22, our 23rd ranked in story. A lot of work could be done here. I really think that the author needs to focus on the dialogue for the characters, because it's kind of basic, and especially the characters, and making sure that if it is the 11th Doctor he's portraying, make sure he kind of gets the dialogue right from the show. The, the kind of kooky 11th Doctor who's going to kick butt and stuff like that. That's what I, I didn't get that from this mission, but if you could get that in there, I think it would really give a boost to story there. All right, technical here. The maps were pretty good. I loved them. Did you like them, Wee Wee? Oh, there are quite a few maps that are, are really impressive, yeah. Um, not as many as I would like, not not onto like, the scale. It's not exactly consistent throughout yeah. the entire mission, but Some there are, are quite a few good maps in that mission, definitely. I know you get to you get to fly your shuttle in a Borg interior, and we've seen that in another mission by Kirkfat, and I think he pulled it, Kirkfat pulled it off a little bit better in his because you had more maps like that. But this is still a really good Borg interior map, which I love. I mean, it it obviously takes the authors tons of time to put this together, but you see that there's a part where you go down to a planet and two comets are flying in the sky, and that's just cool to look up and see. So there's some cool stuff like that. Uh, transitions though between these maps. They weren't as up to par as other missions. They are actually, you hit loading screen, screens quite frequently, and it is noticeable. Because for someone like me, I probably score much higher on transitions than WeeWee does, because I don't notice them as much, and they don't get under my skin as much. This mission, though, it did, because I, I, I noticed that I was hitting frequent loading screens, especially with these Borg interior maps, which I don't know if that's avoidable or not, but I, I did notice it there, and it kind of started getting a little bit... Mm. I'd like to point out that there are on a couple of occasions during the time loops that the author does indeed actually yeah. carry out a type of thing where he doesn't change the map at all. It, it's just, it's just a change of the around yeah. it, like the, the, the objects and everything. Yeah, I do so remember that happening once. Like that, but for the rest of them, there are a lot of maps to go through. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, the author, though, shows some great knowledge of the Foundry through the use of triggers like that one to avoid a map transfer, which was good to see. And he does some awesome triggers with all this stuff going on, and that was really cool to see. So when you're playing through this mission, expect to have some wow moments where stuff just goes boom in your face, or wow, what's that? That's really cool to see. And he does some great art asset usage for objects like that. One of the most awesome ones that I think we're... I don't know what we decided this was, but when you beam down to a planet, of course, there's the debris of the TARDIS, which is obvious because the person's like, well, the outside looks like it was this size, but inside it looks like there was more. It was bigger on the inside, blah, blah, blah. We know it's the TARDIS. But when you get up to the TARDIS, the starburst effect is using, is being used. So for those of you who aren't Foundry authors, it's the effect. It's like this big uh, gold shining light that's going as you go close to it. And... So at first I thought it was the TARDIS noise because you know it makes that. I can't do it. Shut up. But I thought it was that noise at first. And Wee Wee, what did you think it was? Well, actually initially I thought I thought I thought I would. There was no reason to dispute that theory there. But then a bit of dialogue later on kind of pointed towards the fact that he was actually regenerating. Yeah, that in that time loop he was actually regenerating, and I was like. Oh, that that's a good point. The, that would effectively lead back to the fact that that Doctor wasn't, that we mentioned earlier, wasn't the 7th at all. It might have been like the next regeneration, the 12th one or something. But it just happened to be wearing the claws. Because well, at least in that loop. Because I know yeah. we, we, you jump back and then it kind of gets all redone again. But in that one, I actually, I don't know if it was the TARDIS noise he was trying to represent or the Doctor regenerating there. It could have been both. It could have been neither. I don't know, but it was cool. And that was a great use of art asset. Uh, usage there to just do something simple as that. And then creativity was awesome in this mission too. We've got some nice effects on the map such as that, a creative use of the starburst effect, awesome interiors and stuff. Um, there's a point where you beam over to a board cube and the floor's liquidy and they told you that before you beam over and he's using like the water around riser I guess. So when you jump down it represents the, the liquid that was flooding the corridor or whatever. That was cool to see. And they're, I you're think gonna... we're actually looking over that hole there, and saying, "What's down here then?" Yeah, we... it. And I was like, "Oh, this is where we're supposed to go." Fair enough. Then. Yeah, we were looking down. It's like, "Are we supposed to jump down there?" And I go, "We, we, you jump first. And he jumps down. And he's shooting boring. Like, I guess we are. <laughs> so we jump down. <laughs> but uh, 
So there were a lot of wow moments in this mission, so bonus on creativity there. The user help was pretty good. There was a nice addition that you really picked up on because we all know Wii Wii's connection is pretty bad in these calls, not call them out, but so this computer's got a, a bit of a slower connection. And this mission accounts for that because there's tons and tons of effects thrown in this mission that could slow down lower end computers. But for computers that aren't high end, like mine here, I'm rubbing it in, Wii Wii. For, for lower end computers, there's an option that you get uh, on some of these maps where it's like, uh, disable some of the effects. So it's easier to progress because you know when you get tons of effects in a map, you get tons of lag and it's harder to play a mission. So it's a nice little option there for those people who have lower end systems, which was great. Um, there was one little issue where uh, you enter this nebula static effect. The favorite one from the Foundry launch, where everybody used it. Now it's kind of not being used as much, but this it's used in this mission. And when you go into it, of course, you lose your mini-map, meaning you can't find the waypoint, because you're supposed to fly into it. Mm -hmm. So, we, we flew up to the north pole of the planet, and nothing was happening, because we were supposed to go straight. But he couldn't tell, because the waypoint, he couldn't find it on the map. So, a pl that's something you might want to look into, is either have a flashing nav beacon on the map, where you can still use... The, uh, the nebula static effect, or take that out completely. I don't know if it's needed in that point, but you need to have it that the person knows where to go, especially at that point, and especially in a space map, because if they fly to the wrong height, or they go somewhere completely different and they can't find the waypoint, it's going to lead them to dropping your mission in one star. Yeah, that's something you want to avoid. And no foundry limitations in the mission. I didn't pick up on any as playing through it. How did I? Which is good to see. I mean, yep. um, especially with all this tech stuff. With some kind of limitation or something, but this one didn't really have any. Yeah, what did it score we on tech here? A 7.72, which actually put it at a pretty decent ninth place. So it's very, it's very good on uh, technical. I think and if you're going to really check this, I think if you're going to check out this mission, check it out for some of the cool technical tricks. I think especially Foundry authors will love to see what this uh, author's done because there's some really cool and interesting stuff that he's pulled off here. Game Master Wee Wee, speak. <laughs> Let's get into it, shall we? Start with the almost usual gameplay, which was functional. There's the standard reach markers and interactive objects, as usual. But the problem with the space gameplay in this mission was due to the fact that the player has to keep turning effectively 180 degrees a lot and going back the way they came. It's not exactly the most enjoyable thing for a player in the world because all they're doing is going back and forward all the time. And, I mean, the time loops make it, it it's good, but you just go all the time. And it's just, okay, I have to keep turning my ship. It's, it's easier to shuttle because you've got a high time rate, but that kind of thing. But still, it's, there's nothing much beyond these points. Not even a puzzle, surprisingly. So, yeah, I think there should have been a puzzle. It, yeah. There's a point where, I was, where we were playing through it, especially on my first playthrough where I played solo. So I have the solo play experience, and then we have the group play experience. But for, for um, when I was first playing it, I felt like they were leading up to this puzzle when you reach a satellite or something, because I was getting information. I was like, oh, I should probably remember this. We get to the satellite and it's just press F, and I'm like, oh, I thought there was going to be a puzzle. So that was kind of a letdown there. I think the author could totally put a puzzle there. Mm hmm, I agree. And speaking of other space stuff, there is combat, and it was really enjoyable. The fact that you're in your shuttle for this mission makes combat a lot more interesting. It really it does. It can be a lot harder in some cases, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, the basic groups used by the Borg against a player would normally be unenjoyable, just like standing probes or spheres on that occasion, that's very boring. The squishy ones. The fact ones. that you're in a shuttle, yeah, the fact that you're in a shuttle makes it both difficult and interesting. So, watch out for that kind of, if you're not a very good shuttle player, if you don't, or if you don't, go in it very often. But, there is a combat boss fight in space at the end, which is pretty difficult. Even if you're in a shuttle, a well specked out ship, be careful. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, when the cube warped in, and since we were in a group, we had two warp in, we were just like, oh, crap, and then a plasma torpedo's flying in after Wii Wii, and yeah. I tried to save him, but apparently targeting sensors on these shuttles are not that great because I missed every time I shot at it, so I'm going to be yelling at my engineer to fix it because it's the stinking 25th century. What's it, what's it, what makes it even worse is the fact that I, I got destroyed even before the hyperplasmas actually impacted my ship. I got two going my way and got destroyed before they even came to me. So it's it's a very difficult thing to do, um, especially in a group. So it's, yeah, watch out for that. But uh, there is a bit of ground, but it was weak. Again, there are normal reach markers and interactive objects, but again, like space, there's nothing much beyond that point. Again, no puzzle, which is kind of a shame, really. Um, it's much more of a space-oriented mission. Yep. But ground probably could use a bit of work. 
Um, com- combat was a little bit better, but it was only interesting. Some cases are multi attack groups, which, like I said, makes it interesting. Yep. Uh, there are low level groups, which are used to compensate for this, and stacking, not make it too difficult. So As long as you have a remodulator. Yeah. Because I didn't have a remodulator when that when I got in that first battle, I was like, "Oh crap!" So I had to just rifle butt and rifle butt. I was lucky enough to actually have the three-piece mako set, so yeah. <laughs> I had mine too. I just didn't have the uh, mako rifle equipped. It was on a boff because I have a boff that uses it instead of me. Unless I go into an SDF and I'll just switch them up. And I didn't do that because like, oh wait, this is a Borg mission. I should probably switch them up. Yeah, because our mindsets are usually on SDFs, like Romanjula, every other Borg won't. Uh, it's actually not the case. People forget that yep. normal Borg missions actually do. Just, they they, they really have their yeah they're gonna adapt the Borg exist out of the STFs, who knew? Mm, mm, who knew? Um, there are other cases, however, with only one or two drones hanging towards the player. This, that was down good. The, the I really liked that. Blue area, which I dropped down first and almost killed. Uh, this could be partly due to the terrain in the surrounding area because it was very complicated and there was a lot of water in that area, and the drones are easy to pick off nonetheless. So. It's, it's not going to get too difficult. One, got left, one went ahead and the other got left behind. And then another one got sent and we just got shot them into the face or something. So, ugh. I really liked it, though, because it did feel like... Because uh, it tells you to leave your boffs behind or whatever. So it was just me and we were progressing mm. forward. I know he rounded a corner and he starts shooting at some Borg. And I, I looked right and there was a Borg behind him. So he would have been flanked. So I'm just like, bam, get that Borg before he could do anything bad. So, but Shotguns really are really awesome, it. by the way. Yeah, they are. Um, there is a bit of replayability in this mission. It is present... There's no alternate endings, but it is limited to multipath dialogue, which is but it's interesting for the player to choose to make this decision or that decision, that kind of thing. Um, again, no alternate endings, plenty of alternate dialogue to keep the player guessing. What, what should the player choose during the mission to make? Is this, is this the right decision? Is that the right decision? What's the right decision here? It's up to the player to choose that. There's a lot of information along the way to help that. I really, yeah, I really did like you were able to call in reinforcements, so if you're a bad player, or you just one extra hand and you're like, I don't care for a tough fight, you can call in some reinforcements. But if you're one of those players who's like, I just want to kill everything on my own, I don't need your help, you can do that too. So it's a really nice multipath way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Overall, gameplay scored a 6.5, which put it in a pretty mediocre 18th place. Gameplay could use a bit of work. There are yeah. some good points like space combat, but generally it could be improved overall. All right, what do we have to say overall, Wee Wee? So, is this a good crossover between Star Trek and Doctor Who? It is a good uh, crossover mission slash episode. If you like them, if you like both franchises, check this mission out. There's also good technical work here, but story and gameplay, as mentioned earlier, could be improved in several categories and overall as well. Yeah, if you're somebody who doesn't like Doctor Who, because I did read people in the in the reviews they were giving to this mission, going, "I hate Doctor Who. Doctor Who sucks." One star. Don't don't bother checking no, it out then, because yeah, if you really really hate Doctor Who, then you don't want to check this one out. But if you like both, check it out because it's really fun. That it overall scored a 6.79, 21st ranked in overall. Mm. So yeah, yeah it's good. good. It could use some improvement it, to bump it, it up to the, it, to that it, average it, seven. It could use a lot of uh, improvements. I mean, I was close pretty skewed because we've been reviewing a lot of really awesome missions but um generally this mission is pretty good but there are a lot of improvements i could uh, make this mission a lot lot better and our tips of the week this week it is touchstoning now what is touchstoning it's essentially referencing or putting things into your missions, in this case, to make it feel a lot more interesting. Like, you referenced a previous event, or, and, and, or it, your mission is continuing from that event, or it's just a simple name reference. Um, like, uh, the, we, it was before in the first, first cause and effect. Let's take that. We referenced the fact that the, the TNG episode, uh, cause and effect, is basically a reference from this mission. So that that kind of things are essentially touched on, referencing previous events in canon history or any canon history in the missions we've just reviewed, case and put it in your mission. That's essentially what it is. So referencing by names is basically a way of touchstoning. But if you really want to touch on an advanced way for your plot, integrate in your story that's currently occurring. It's a fantastic way to do it. It progresses your mission based on an actual event, like. Um, Take that event, take that mission I just said for example. That's basically 
Rog Enterprise has put that mission in and has directly referenced that episode. They've used actual records from the Enterprise D and put that into the mission so it'll help the crew and yourself as the captain, the player, get out of that situation. Another good touch turning point is in the Pale Moonlight, where Cisco hands over a bit of biometric gel through some kind of transaction during the episode. And what happens to that biometric gel after the episode? What happens to it? I mean, you've got Romulans as the minion war, so yeah, that's all right then. That's a very short-term solution, but what happens to that biometric gel in the long term? Maybe a mission around that, that that's a good way to integrate into your plotline. And the best way to touch stuff for people who are looking for that in the mission is to continue an old plot, like I've just said, and pick up where from where it left off. There are tons of storylines and structure that could picked up and written about today. So generally, touch running, a fantastic thing, and if you can integrate into your plotline or continue from the old plotline, really well. major conversation that's happening between Foundry authors right now, major debate is over this spotlight mission change that's happened. And basically the debate is, is this a good thing for Foundry authors or is it a bad thing? Is this a good system to have or is it not? So our poll question for you this week is, is it worth having a spotlight mission if you no longer have the rights to control your work? Basic answers, yes or no. None of this maybe crap. I mean, it's like, yeah, I can see some pros, I can see some cons. No. Okay. Basically, our answer we want is, if you could have your spotlight mission spotlighted, would you say yes or no? And that's basically what it comes down to, because there's none of this maybe, or I do it if this, or do it if not. So You guys already know our views on it. We, we said it earlier in the episode, but we need, I'm your, no. we need your input on this whole thing. Yeah, because, I mean, we're only two people. I mean, what does the entire Foundry author community think of? So we have a poll set up, much better than our last one, because last time we put it on our Jupiter Force forums, because I didn't know how to do polls like this before, where oh, if you, you have to have an account. This time, you don't need an account. You just click on the link, you say yes or no, boom, and it, your vote's in. So go ahead and vote in that. The link will be uh, anywhere where the steps is posted below. Go vote. We will be covering that next week. So you got one week to do your votes, and we'll see what people really think about this new system. Send us your mission trailers, feedback on the show, and other cool Foundry community stuffs that you might have going on to foundryfiles at gmail.com. Also, if you just want to write up what you think about the Spotlight mission process now, if yes or no isn't a good enough answer for you and you really want to tell us what your opinion is on this, you can also send it there as well. So definitely send it there. You can also leave comments in the show below. We've also, this is huge, especially for those who love our reviews the most. We've made our ranking table available to all to view. So that means you can go check out the scores of all the missions we've reviewed at a link that we will include in the show notes. So go ahead and check it out because we've got, what, 22, 23 missions there? And you can see where all of them stack, which ones are there a great story, which ones is great overall, stuff like that. So you can go check that out. We don't know what we're reviewing next week. Hopefully it's something good. Hopefully we get some news. I have a feeling we won't because this week was huge on news, and we'll see. But uh, thanks for tuning in this week. I guess we'll see you next week. Well, actually, actually, I have um, an Enterprise face pistol that doesn't work anymore. Well, it doesn't need to work. It, you just go get it. Enterprise face. I don't even own that one. That one's awesome. Uh, I want I've had it for like 10 years. Awesome. Go get it. Doop, 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 doop. Wee Wee's getting his phaser. So we're gonna talk about foundry stuff today, cause, 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 cause talking about the foundry is what we're supposed to do. Wee Wee doesn't want me to talk about stuff like dilithium, cause I talked about dilithium once and he, I got yelled at, and it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. I mean, it was mean. And it hurt my feelings, and I cried. I went and cried. But yeah, dilithiums. Phew, economy's down, man. You gotta just buy your zen and quick just keep buying your zen people so the price just keeps well using your dilithium of course so it keeps going down and stuff because you know 
economy stuff. I don't know about economy stuff. Economy stuff's crazy, you know. And then when the crazy people start talking about the economy and stuff, they're all like, it's going to the poop suit, and they don't know what's going on. And then you go out back and shoot yourself a gopher pigeon. And then, so, I have this pen here. I don't know what it does. I think you click it like this. Oh, okay, that's how you do it. Well, that's mystery solved. Boundary files, watch it. Anybody want a wow pass? This is how much I get paid for this show. Bam. I know. Actually, hold on. I do get paid for this show. Ready? Hold on. Where is it? I have money here. Hold on. I got a penny. Um, a gift card to McDonald's. Oh, and a health care plan. That's good. I don't think he found it. In fact, I think someone stole it. Cause somebody's always stealing that stuff. Always stolen. It hurts. It hurts real bad. What? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's like you're crazy or something. I heard walking. Oh, that's him. I think. It could be. Uh, I don't I know. Couldn't find it. Ah, 